This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Neil Adams, Raphael Medoff, and Craig Yo. Greetings, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, and on this episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Neil Adams, Raphael Medoff, and Craig Yo. They've recently released a new collection, We Spoke Out, Comic Books and the Holocaust, and I talk with all three of those guys about their project. But before I share with you that interview, I want to let you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. And if you go to DCB Service right now, you'll find that you can get a copy of We Spoke Out, Comic Books and the Holocaust, at a whopping 35% off of the cover price. This is a great hardback that should definitely be a part of your collection. But you can also find other Yo! books at DCB Service, including Super Weird Heroes, Haunted Love, and The Art of Archie Covers at a similarly impressive 35% off cover price. No matter how you slice or dice it, you can't beat the prices at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to DCBService.com for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. I've been lucky enough to have all three of today's guests on the podcast before. I've briefly interviewed Neil Adams at a couple of different cons, releasing those conversations as part of our on-location convention shows. Raphael Medoff was part of our special roundtable on politics and comics that was released on Election Eve 2016. And, of course, as listeners of the podcast well know, we've had Craig Yo on the show so many times that I've about lost count. What makes this such a notable episode is that now I get all three of these guys on at the same time to talk about their new book, We Spoke Out, Comic Books and the Holocaust. Each comes with his own set of experiences with this collection, but what comes across so clearly in the interview is how Neil, Raphael, and Craig easily play off of one another and become a lean, mean, creative team. In fact, I happened to talk with them right before they headed over to the American Jewish Historical Society in New York for the book's official launch. It was a fun and insightful conversation, and let's listen to that now. I have the absolute pleasure of having back on the podcast Neil Adams, Raphael Medoff, and Craig Yo. They are the authors, editors of We Spoke Out, Comic Books, and The Holocaust, which was released last month in comic shops, and next week we will see a broad release of it. Neil, Raphael, Craig, welcome to the show. I think last week. I don't think we've been been all three together before, so this is great. (laughs) <laughs> now, yeah. you're right. Each each of you have been on the podcast before. Neil, I don't know if you remember, but I've spoken with you a couple of times briefly at various cons. Maybe and, you're Wizard, having, huh? and you're having me back? And you're having me back? What's mm-hmm. wrong with you? Yeah, I'm a glutton for punishment. And one I thing that, that mentions, or that, that underscores the fact that I'm a glutton for punishment is I'm having Craig back for the umpteenth time. Yes, there you go. <laughs> and, Isn't and, this your... With Rafi? No, actually, Rafi 
you were on a show two years ago. We did a roundtable discussion, if you recall, on political cartoons, and we did a special episode on that the week of the election in 2016. And uh, so we had him on the show. How'd that that turn out, that election? Yeah, it turned out really bad. Really badly. The the roundtable right. turned out well, and I hope that there's no connection between the success of that roundtable, where we discuss cartoonists against the Holocaust, the elect- and the election. So yeah. there's a connection of the election to just about everything. Let's yeah. not talk about it. No. Yeah. Yes. Moving on. Okay, Moving so on. Uh, some of our listeners may have already started to see we spoke out in their comic shops. But for those who may not have yet or haven't picked it up, shame on them, um, describe this. What is We Spoke Out? Well, uh, let me just start and uh, say that these are uh, stories about the Holocaust. Uh, Of course, they couldn't have been done before the Holocaust began or even through the Holocaust because the Nazis were very good at covering it up and uh, hiding it, even though there were some people who did know about it. It was not generally known. And after the, after the war, uh, uh, as the news came out, different people in the comic book industry, just like uh, writers in newspapers and, and other places, began to do stories about the Holocaust without regard to, is this the right thing to do or, is, or are we, uh, should we be uh, first in line here? Um, comic book people are not uh, reticent to, um, to take little chances because... Really, nobody respects, respected comic books very much in those days, so you could pretty much do what you wanted to do. So there was an opportunity to tell stories uh, about the Holocaust. And to be perfectly honest, one of the first ways that I was, outside of the fact that my father was in the Army and I was in Germany, uh, exposed to the Holocaust was in a story that I would only heard quietly from my friends Okay, that was uh, done in EC Comics. That was just about the most powerful story uh, uh, that we have in the book. It's called Master Race, mm-hmm. and it was by it was drawn by uh, uh, Bernard Craigstein, who is a very very underrated uh, but terrific uh, artist, uh, almost legendary in in, uh, in our circles. Who did a story about about uh, the uh, character in in the fa- scene in the subway, but was obviously an escapee from uh, Nazi Germany, and and that was that that was a legendary story, and uh, art comic book artists and writers would track it down so they could see what Craigstein did and how that story was handled. I'm well, not all too let me, sure. Let me that. Check for just a second, Neil. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, Al Feldstein. Uh, uh, wrote the story and it's certainly everybody loves Kristine's uh, visuals, but uh, so Felstein kind of gets overlooked, but Felstein did write the story. Yes, he did. And I, and he did a, he did a very good job. Uh, but uh, being an artist, of course, <laughs> uh, <Sure. laughs> the, the handling of the, of the story by Craigstein, Craigstein had a very rough time in the comic book business, but, uh, uh, he did do this. He did uh, several really legendary stories, but this one was, uh, it, it just set you back. As a comic book reader, you didn't expect to see this kind of a story. And I'm not saying that all the stories in this book are like that, but but there are some that are. And and, and the exploring of the Holocaust is, is a difficult thing for anybody to do, but the comic books were not reticent to do this. And this is an exploration of Maybe not everything, but boy, we we did go to uh, all the corners to find some of the very best stuff, and uh, it, this was all started by Rafi Medoff here, who uh, felt that this was a significant and important thing for us to do, and got us together to do it. In fact, you anticipated my next question, which was the you know what was the genesis of We Spoke Out? In other words, how did all of you get together? So, Rafi, you're the one who pulled the band together. Well, I first approached Neil um, seven or eight years ago um, in connection with a um, a cause with which I was involved, a, uh, a a campaign to bring about the return of some paintings that had been done in Auschwitz by a prisoner um, during the Holocaust. Uh, her name was Dina Babbitt. She later went on to become uh, an, an animator um, in Hollywood. 
But she was a prisoner in Auschwitz. She was forced by the Nazis to, to create a number of portraits um, of gypsy prisoners. She survived the Holocaust, and after the war, the paintings turned up um, in the hands of the museum that was established at the site of where that death camp was. It's called the Auschwitz State Museum. And Mrs. Babbitt had been waging a kind of a lonely struggle to try to convince the museum to give her back her original artwork. When I heard about her plight, um, I immediately thought of Neil Adams because as a teenage comic book fan, I was well aware of the struggle that he had led um, to try to bring about the return of original artwork to comic book artists. So I saw a natural connection there, and I went, I went to meet him, um, but not as a comic book fan. I went as a, you know, as a Jewish historian involved in Holocaust um, scholarship and, uh, and education. Neil, within five minutes, um, saw through my guise, and he realized that I was, in fact, a comic book fan, uh, thinly disguised as a Jewish historian. And on that basis, we, we, we created together a, um, a comic strip about Dina Babbitt's plight, um, told what happened to her and appealed for the return of the paintings. And that, that comic strip was published um, by Marvel as part of its um, miniseries on Magneto, who, as comic fans well know, himself has a, a backstory involving uh, time that he spent at Auschwitz. During the course of working on that comic strip about Dina Babbitt, um, I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time um, chatting with Neil about, about related subjects. And we got to talking at one point about um, how comic book, um, about, about how comic books might have played a role in teaching young Americans about the Holocaust back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s which is to say, in the years before it was taught in schools, in the years before there were films like Schindler's List, in the years before there was a U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, before people were really talking about it, how did young people in America learn about it? Now, my personal experience was this. I grew up in a suburb of New York City um, in the 1970s, and the Holocaust was barely touched upon in um, social studies classes in the segment of World War II, there was sort of like a passing reference to it, maybe two minutes of newsreel footage of the Allies liberating one of the death camps, and we saw piles of bodies, but, you know, that's not, you can't learn a lot about the Holocaust from two minutes of uh, footage. Um, but Neil and I t talked about um, the fact that in those days, in the 70s, a lot of very serious subjects were being talked about in comic books. This is something the general public didn't uh, quite appreciate, but we teenagers we're learning about racism and uh, poverty and over um, overpopulation and other serious issues in the pages of comic books like Green Lantern, Green Arrow, mem memorably written by Denny O'Neill and drawn by Neil Adams. Um, it was precisely uh, Neil's incredible, realistic artwork that made those subjects come to life for me as a teen. So. I remembered vividly how I was introduced to those kinds of issues through comic books, and Neil and I wondered, well, how about the Holocaust? Would that, did comic books ever talk about the Holocaust? And that's where the research began, which ultimately led us to create this book. Hmm. Now, at what and, point did you bring this project? Oh, and, so, and so was enlisted Craig Yeo, who, oh. is, a, who is a major force in uh, – uh, putting together uh, publications like this, who has uh, got relationships with the publishers and can get things done. It's not uh, Craig is not a person who uh, uh, stands aside and uh, if, if the if the project is worthwhile, let somebody else do it. He just plunges right in and uh, moves forward. And he not only does have ha not only did this, but has projects on his own that are. Well, I don't want to say more significant because, of course, we're talking about this now. But he certainly has done things to uh, to advance the uh, uh, use of comic books in many areas. And I think now is the time to ask Craig. Oh, thank you, Neil, for that uh, those props. And uh, I, I did come to the uh, to the game on this one pretty late. I mean, Neil and Rafi were such an incredible. Team, I don't know. So, some ways, I don't, don't know if they needed a third player, but uh, certainly Neil has his art 
chops and, and, and uh, high stature in, in the comics community. And Rafi's, you know, uh, a major, major Holocaust uh, uh, historian. So that they, they certainly made a formidable team to, to, to start to put this together. But I, I entered as a, as an editor and publisher and, uh, the project was originally, I think Neil pitched it to, uh, my parent publishing company, IDW. And they were of course, uh, vitally interested, uh, but contacted me because, uh, I have focused a lot on, uh, comics history books. And this is certainly a, a, about history of, of two things, the history of the Holocaust and the history of, of cartoonists uh, speaking out and, and raising their voices, hence, hence the name of our book. Uh, we we spoke out comics uh, about the Holocaust. So uh, it was my great privilege to to to, to uh, team up with these these two esteemed gentlemen and uh, and start to put the book together and then do a little uh, work with them also a little more uh, research. We found. Uh, uh, Certainly, Neil is, uh, during the period of the Green Lantern and, and, and the Batman stories, uh, and the Batman story we have in here, and then Rafi and Neil together on the uh, the last outrage story about Dina Bobbitt, which, is in, it, which uh, ends our book. Uh, certainly, they, they were well-versed in, in those areas, but I, I was able to also uh, to find stories uh, from early horror comics and uh, an odd comic book called Stamp Comics, which uh, some bright publisher had the uh, idea like, well, kids love comics and kids love stamps. So let's have a comic <laughs> book called Stamp Comics, and it's sure to be a big hit. So I think in the second and maybe final issue of this uh, harebrained idea, th- there was a fascinating story about a stamp. And Robbie can tell us more about that background, but it is totally related to the horror to the to the to the Holocaust and and interestingly it, it's kind of a, a horror story uh, from the 1950s which uh, horror was a big uh, genre of the time uh, and it's interesting because as a genre uh, teachers and parents and rabbis and ministers and educators uh, were you know railing out against horror. Uh, horror comics and the comic book industry in general, but, but actually there was some pro social stories uh, uh, like this one from stamp comics that was both educational and specifically educational about the Holocaust that, uh, that were again, teaching a uh, young people, uh, uh, about, about the, the horrors of the Holocaust. And there was a great horror artist that they enlisted to, to draw this story. And it, it's actually one of the more powerful, short, but very powerful stories in the book. Yeah, that's the story, uh, Escape from Maidnik. Yes. It's, yeah. interesting that, it's interesting that while Congress was attacking comic books for contributing to juvenile delinquency, comic books were out there discussing these things that were so significant to our society that uh, kids couldn't, weren't exposed to any other way. Uh, and that it took, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that comics were the spark plug for that, but comic books have always stood out and discussed um, uh, issues of the day and were not only not responsible, uh, as they indicated back in the day, for juvenile delinquency, they were responsible for an educated uh, uh, educated kids across America. And they still do that job. I mean, uh, uh, comic books are written for adults and they're read by kids. And uh, I would say that uh, you're going to find, uh, if you if you get this book, and you do uh, give it to your kids. We, if you have explained the Holocaust to your kids, which I think it's important to do, then you're going to give them something that they can readily absorb and pay attention to instead of some of the more horrible things that you see on public television, which uh, make it very, very difficult to, to see these things. At least we have uh, using a popular medium uh, and telling stories, we have ways of explaining these things to younger generations uh, that uh, need to know about this. And I don't think anybody disagrees that we need to know about this. You know, Craig is a great expert on EC Comics, and he found um, in his research a particularly fascinating uh, comic strip that we included in the book called Desert Fox, written by the legendary Harvey Kurtzman, illustrated by the equally legendary Wally Wood. 
Um, and the remarkable thing about this particular um, comic strip, Desert Fox, is this. It was published in 1951 at a time when there was a sort of a public debate, especially among historians, about whether the famous Nazi, infamous Nazi General Rommel was just a loyal soldier um, and therefore uh, should not be regarded the way we look at uh, other Nazi leaders as war criminals, or whether he was in fact complicit in war crimes. And there were a number of prominent um, kind of revisionist historians who were trying to remake Rommel's image. And the comic strip um, by Kurtzman Wood is actually a response to that public debate. It's actually Kurtzman and Wood kind of, in effect, giving a comic book version of a response of what historians should have been saying um, in response to this kind of revisionism. It's really quite a fascinating piece to, to see something that is in comic strip form, but is really almost at the level of a, of a scholarly rebuttal to people who were trying to whitewash this uh, Nazi general. I, I think if, if you guys don't mind, uh, it, it's important for us to mention that uh, we went to the various publishers who basically own these stories, and they all cooperated with us uh, to see that these stories got reprinted without charging us any money and um, uh, made it possible for this book to come together. So we are the, thir- the fourth partner in this is DC, Marvel, and the other companies that made this book possible by letting us use their stories. Yeah, the other partners were EC and Warren Publication. Right. And, and DC and Marvel. You and know, that's one, of the be- things, that's one of the things that struck me about this book is that it's a collection where you have comics not from smaller publishers or, let's say, non-DC or Marvel – you do, but you also have strips from DC and Marvel, which yeah. seems to be almost impossible in other anthologies, in other collections, but you were able to pull it off. Well, it's, I, 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 I was uh, glad to, to read some commentary on like Facebook today. People were, were marveling that we were able to pull together all these different publishers and get them you know, behind the same cause. And, and, they were and marveling? And DCing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yes, and they were DCing too. Thank you, not just marveling, but and they, uh, and they were uh, delighted to do uh, it. They, no, certainly, we got cooperation from everybody. It's uh, yeah. really quite fantastic. Yeah, they were very enthusiastic and very supportive uh, uh, from the get go. Now, one of the things that you, Rafi, point out in your introduction and also in the introductory brief essays that accompany each of the 18 comic entries, and they do a great job of setting a context. But you point out that it wasn't until we get into, I don't know, maybe around the 1970s that more attention, significantly more attention within comics, or just pop culture in general, uh, starts to find its way, you know, uh, instructing people about the Holocaust. And I... Would, was wondering as I was reading through this collection how many comics that dealt with the Holocaust in one form or another that you could have included, but for different reasons you may not have decided to include. How many of those were there, and how painful might it have been to exclude some and include others? Well, um, there are additional stories that, of course, we could not – uh, include just because there wasn't enough room. We did take out, we, we did, we wanted to present the ones that we felt, um, that we felt really made the major points and were the, and, and likely had the most impact on their readers at the time. Uh, you know, like it all, in all comic book work, there, there were comic strips that were, uh, that were related to the Holocaust that were better or worse, that, you know, were not as effective or not as interesting, um, and likely did not have, um, as much impact as the others. So we, we excluded a number, but, um, but we have a, a very significant number in this book. It's a, it's a, it's a big book, and, um, and it's a wide cross-section of Holocaust-related strips starting in the 50s and going until uh, the 80s. I think you can put uh, yourself in Rafi's place when you have, a, let's say, books from 1 to 20, a story from 1 to 20, you're going to pick the books, the stories that relate to the Holocaust, and you're not going to pick a war story. 
that just happens to, by the way, mention releasing prisoners or whatever it is, you're going to hit those stories that uh, are the, the stories that basically follow the title we spoke out, speaking out about the Holocaust. Because you know, look at uh, we understand Rafi's goal. Goal Rafi's goal is to be a reminder, make sure we don't forget about the Holocaust, and that's part of the goal of the book. Yet it's not done so heavy-handed that it becomes uh, it becomes so dour that it's not something that you don't read with a certain amount of entertainment, but also also an, a certain amount of education and a certain amount of understanding of what it was like. So those stories that applied itself to those goals were the ones that you would put at the front of the list, and the other ones were incidental, because this book would be quite, this book would be about four times as big as it is uh, if we included everything. You know, and, it, and it would be h- half as good because I mean the yeah. editing process. We, I, I don't think there's any major omissions. I mean, I think we've identified and looked at and considered every. Story that really deals with the Holocaust, like Neil says, not not just mentions the Holocaust, but it's really you know that, that that's the core of this story is dealing with the Holocaust. And I think we looked at every single one of them and uh, and identified every single one of them, and, and, we, and we chose the very very best. I don't I don't think there's any what you would use the term major omissions uh, on. I think we've got a, every every great story, and we might have eliminated two that really didn't center on the Holocaust or or uh, weren't that well done or uh uh or maybe were repetitious uh in regards to something else another another story that we felt was a better presentation so i mean i don't think i don't think there's any major omissions i i really stand by that i think we really covered it and have the the best of the best and it's a strong message and if we we would have had more we then we w- would have ended up with less as far as uh, uh, so with my favorite, Master Race, which is uh, really a fantastic uh, story. And my favorite, uh, next next to Neil's uh, Batman story. Mm. They're right up. That's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> and I, I agree. With, uh, starting off with Master Race and then ending with uh, the comic that uh, Neil and Rafi did about Dino Bobbitt. I mean, I, we have great bookends uh, to hold the, hold the books inside together. So. Uh, uh, that if anybody reads this and can offer any assistance on getting those paintings back from the Auschwitz Museum, we welcome your help, and we, it's still an ongoing battle that needs to be taken care of. Dina has died; her two daughters are left. We intend to get those paintings, and you know what? The first thing that will happen, they'll loan the paintings to the museum as soon as they get them back. I mean, it's just it's it's a, it, it, we're looking for a happy ending for everybody, and I and please make sure you read that story. Uh, make sure you read all the stories, but uh, pay attention to Dina Bab because it's still happening. And and Stan Lee gives a uh, an afterword about to the, he not only writes an introduction to the book, but he gives an afterword about uh, that story. Since we end with that story, then he gives an afterword about it, and so it's so uh, important to the to to the whole comics community. And I I remember admiring uh, the cause that Neil and Rafi uh, started to try to get those paintings back. And uh, I'm hoping that maybe this book, uh, and, and there wasn't a good resolution. She still didn't get the, those paintings, which should be her rightful, and now her estate's rightful property. And uh, I'm hoping now maybe the book will start the conversation up again. And, and uh, as, as a good comic book story goes, that there'll be a, a, a good resolution at the end. And, uh, and, and uh, right, right, right is victorious over wrong. That's right. Now, the story that you guys are mentioning that closes out this collection, uh, The Last Outrage, this is the one that Neil and Rafi collaborated on. It came out in 2008 in Magneto or X-Men Magneto Testament. And well, Rafi, it you uh, – It didn't just come out there. It was in the New York Times. It was, in, it was printed in Germany. It was printed in Israel. It was printed in many places around the world mm-hmm. because we gave it to them for free. Uh, so that they, anybody who was willing to publish it could uh, could publish it. And even now, if anybody wants to publish it in any publication they want, they can get it, uh, not a penny's charge. And in fact, I'll give them $10. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that yeah, go ahead and uh, uh, let people know that uh, this, this is a story that hasn't ended yet, but it will end as a happy ending, but only by the goodwill of people. 
Yeah, and Rafi, you provide a nice contextual essay right before that piece. He wrote it. You know, he wrote that story. Mm-hmm. He presented. This is how much of a fan Rafi is. He actually, I, I read his uh, his uh, outline. Uh, I, you couldn't call it an outline. The story. And I read it as if I were reading a comic book script, and I used every word that he wrote and put it into the story. So that's, uh, I don't know, do you have any other credits, uh, Rafi, in doing comic books? Well, I think it was your first credit. After Neil and I did The Last Outrage, then we had the opportunity to collaborate again on a series of uh, motion comics Mm -hmm. for Disney, uh, for Disney's educational division, on a related theme, on Americans who spoke out during the Holocaust to try to rescue Jews. So um, I have had the great pleasure of working with Neil now on several projects, which is something that, as a 15-year-old fanboy, I could never have imagined would one day be the case. But as Neil says, this is a kind of an educational or humanitarian crusade. We're trying to get certain messages out, and it's fun for me personally to add to that this is all going through the, the comic book world in which I grew up. Right. Um, but the bigger message is, of course, we live in a time when people are forgetting about the Holocaust or people want to minimize it, and some people even want to deny it. So this kind of book is extremely important in terms of shining a light on, um, on messages and lessons that need to be learned by this generation more than any other. Now, Rafi... Yeah, you and Craig a few years ago came out with Cartoonists Against the Holocaust. In fact, I remember Craig when you called me to let me know about that book and you wanted to talk with me about, you know, possible educational uses for it. I'm wondering is there any connection between Cartoonists Against the Holocaust and this new work, work We Spoke Out? Did one help me to the other? I think there's not exactly, except in the general sense that um Graphic artists played an, an interesting and important role uh, in both cases. The Cartoonists Against the Holocaust was about political cartoonists um, who drew cartoons in American newspapers in the 30s and 40s to try to call attention to the plight of the Jews who were being persecuted by the Nazis. Um, and in We Spoke Out, we're showcasing a, a different community, the post-war community of graphic artists who worked and writers who worked in the comic books industry and use comic books as a, as a medium, but again, a visual medium to talk about a very serious subject. By the way, that community, uh, in addition to, to, to Bernard Krigstein and, and, and the incredible Neil Adams, uh, you know, we, the book's kind of a, besides uh, being a, a who's who of publishers, uh, they're ta- they're, it's a who's who of, who's who of their talent, because we, we, we also have like Gil Kane and Carmen Infantino and Jack Davis and John Severin and, and Gene Cole and Robert Kaniger and Roy Thomas and uh, you know just a, it's in uh, Frank Miller and it's just like a it's an incredible group of artists and writers who who are behind these stories you know and, and it's, it's my the, which one that Joe Kubert oh I'm sorry yes I'm right, sorry right. I, I, I'll be glad to the one to say the name. God Joe Cuber, Joe Cuber, Joe Cuber, probably the best uh, best uh, illustrator of these kinds of stories of anybody, because of course he uh, his family is uh, of course a Jewish family, and he as a child grew up listening to these terrible stories and uh, put his heart and soul into the ones that he did. Thank you for uh, thank you for highlighting him because certainly and and he and he did our back cover. Neil did the front cover, a, a beautiful painting. Um, just for the book, but uh, uh, Kubert uh, did a, a very moving back cover that closes out the book in a powerful way. Uh, and also, besides the characters of cartoonists and writers, that we have the characters of uh, you know major characters from the comic book industry, like Batman and X Men and Captain America. It's it's uh it's it's great to see those superheroes in, in such a great co- cause, uh, fight, fighting for the right. Yeah, and in fact, you guys span a variety of different genres in this collection. You know, there's the horror comics, as you mentioned, there are some superhero stories, and there are also quite a healthy representation of war comics, which I particularly liked. I mean, it just makes sense in in many ways that you would include pieces from various war comics like Sergeant Rock or... I liked it because as a kid growing up in the 1970s, 
the superheroes, I read them occasionally, but they weren't what I really gravitated toward. What I was really interested in were the war comics and the horror comics. And then when you combine those, you get something like Weird War Tales. So I particularly like the Kubert uh, entries yeah. in this collection. Yeah, yeah. Brought back memories. I'm like a comic book fan, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about some of the entries that you have in this collection. Are were there any that really stood out to you guys, or is that like asking what is your favorite child? And maybe I shouldn't ask you that, Neil, because you know you have yeah. a few entries in this collection. Well, let, let me say something about Captain America. You know, every comic book fan is well acquainted with the famous image of that um, nineteen forty two. Um, Captain America comic where Cap is punching Hitler in the face. Um, and then there were, and during World War II, of course, there were lots of comic books having to do with America fighting the Germans, but not pertaining to the Holocaust. One of the very interesting stories we have um, in this book is a Captain America story. In the cover, you see um, Cap on his motorcycle crashing through a line of Nazis um, into a concentration camp. And the, the cover, it says... Um, it happened at Diebenwald. Now, Diebenwald is a made-up name. There was no uh, death camp called Diebenwald, but that's not, that's not important. What's, what's striking is here you have Captain America um, bursting into this camp, not as part of the general war effort, but specifically to try to rescue these innocent people who have been taken uh, prisoner and being held in this Nazi death camp and, um, and will soon be murdered um, unless uh, unless Captain America comes to their rescue, so it's a very different kind of um, sort of a different sort of a contemporary, uh, a more contemporary take on a very classic Captain America image. And you have Captain America, you have the X Men, you have Batman. It's it's comics. It's not you know. It's not as you said. It's not those side issue comics. You know the one that you ones you find in the back of the rack. It's major comic book characters. It's it's the contribution of DC, Marvel, and all their creators. I mean, this is not just a small effort. This is a major effort made by uh, the people who put it together. And I I, I, I consider myself the least on the list. Uh, but also from DC and Marvel Comics, the two major publishers who were glad to uh, contribute their, their stories to, to this book so that... Uh, we could get a proper representation of the whole of the comic book industry and the uh, the, the feelings, as Joe would Joe Kieber would say, therein. Mm. Uh, yes, it, it was. Uh, it was. It, this is a significant book, and I think it's going to remain on people's shelves for a long, long time. Well, you know, one uh, of the we- things that comes up several times in this collection is the educational necessity. Uh, and the educational function that these comics played with kids who weren't exposed to the reality of the horror Holocaust, um, you know, from the 1950s into the 1980s. Now that this book is out, um, it, I mean, in what ways do you see We Speak Out as an educational tool in light of current political and cultural events around the world? Well, as time goes by... I- People lose track of of, uh, of what history really is. I my uh, daughter uh, Christine was in school in Connecticut, and uh, um, her friend, uh, a friend of hers, did not even believe the Holocaust took place. Uh, it's one of those things where you just kind of sit back and go, "Really? Uh, it, you mean we're so lax?" in informing our children that there are people going around who do not believe that the Holocaust took place. You're talking about one of the greatest tragedies in the 20th century, and people don't know about this. You know, uh, uh, I, I put up with uh, Rafi in a very, very positive way because Rafi does the one thing that I think is so significant to our society, and that is to remind us of our history. We cannot go on doing stupid things without being reminded that we are doing stupid things by history. And as we view those things and as we teach them to our children, we have to teach them in ways that they understand. Nobody wants to read some tome that is, you know, uh, 12,000 pages 
that they have to wade through and they will lie about by reading some, you know, little uh, excerpt of it, but actually read things and read words and see pictures that will make them understand what the reality of the world really is that they live in and not to be uh, fed fairy tales that just don't exist. We, we owe this to our kids. We owe it to ourselves, certainly, to remind ourselves, but we more we owe it to our kids. Because when we're gone, if they forget, it could happen again. And that's really the message, isn't it? It could happen again. Do not think for one minute that this kind of thing, it's happening in other places in the world. We know it. I mean, we watch the news every night. And so we don't want it to happen in America. We want our kids to be educated. We want our popular medium to remind them now and then, maybe not so heavily, but certainly remind them in ways that they can absorb it and they can think about it and use their own brains to make their decisions about what their attitudes are going to be. Now, let me just add, um, as the author of, of a number of um, very long and, um, and heavy books about the Holocaust, I'm the first to admit that you can't hand one of my books um, to a 15-year-old and expect them to read it <laughs> and remember the important parts of it. So that's another um, extremely important aspect of this book, We Spoke Out, is this gives teachers something to, to show to, to, um, to a ninth or 10th or 11th grader to help them understand about the Holocaust, but through a medium that's much more interesting, compelling, because it's visual, um, as opposed to standard history text. You know, one of the positive things that we can say about today's world is that in many states today, um, Holocaust and genocide education is required in public schools. Um, but just because it's required doesn't mean that teachers always have the most effective materials to transmit that information. This is a difficult subject. It's a, it's a dark subject. And, um, and a book like We Spoke Out becomes a, a, a teaching tool, a unique way for teachers to, to reach students, to help acquaint them with this subject, instead of just handing them some gigantic history book and hoping that they'll remember something from it. In the most popular medium that a kid can have. I mean, I, I've said this lots of times, but no child goes with their own money to buy a children's book. They use their own money to buy comic books. And so if we can give them something like this with our comic book stories, I think that's very significant. I, I want to disagree. As much as I respect Mr. Neil Adams, I'm going to have to disagree with him. I think he's been a bit of an alarmist. I don't think we have any danger in our world of, uh, of this happening again because I mean, look at our own country. There, there's no leaning towards fascism, and there, there, there's no uh, disparaging of the free press. And, and there's no, the, on the street. There, 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 there's no uh, the, the guns you know, that are killing you know, children in schools. You're right. You know, I now I'm rethinking what uh, you're saying, and you're absolutely right. We have nothing to worry about. In '40s, Neil, and and, and no, 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 no person in government would ever call Nazis fine people. So, like, <laughs> I, I think it's really be a bit of alarmist. You really need to, you know, tone it down, Neil. Yeah, get rid of minorities and stuff like that. You know, no, yeah, that okay. wouldn't happen. You're right. I'm, you know, I take it all back. Yeah, yeah, you're living in your comic book fantasy world. Yeah, the hell with that. <laughs> you know, this does come at a time in our worldwide cultural history where we do see a rise in anti-Semitism. And along with that, going hand in hand with it, is this rise of right wing ideology, and we see this obviously on our just on our bigotry. own soils. But yeah, how about anti Mexican? How about uh, anti black? I mean, there's there's a, we're, there's a rise in anti lots of stuff going on right there's, now. I, I mean, mean, we're I we don't want this in our country. We don't want this kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you know, things. You know, I'm not looking. I'm really not an alarmist, but I will tell you that I, you know, I, I do not turn on the news with a good attitude at night. And a book like this, I feel we're making a very, very small contribution. So, you know, anybody out there who wants to read this, I, I invite them to do it and keep your mind open and and please, please teach your children about history. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now, you, you had mentioned earlier that Stan Lee includes an afterword that accompanies that story on uh, Dina Babbitt. He also wrote the introduction for this collection, did he not? Yes. 
because he is Stan after all. <laughs> He's Stan the man. You know, Stan is uh, Stan is a straight up guy, and uh, and Stan is out there. He never paused a moment when he was asked. Never paused a moment, wouldn't you say, Rafi? No, that's absolutely right. Neil first approached Stan when we were when we were working on the Dean of Abbott comic strip, um, and he right away uh, generously wrote that afterward, which appeared in the Marvel uh, Magneto comic. He narrated one of ours. And then he yeah. Na- yeah. then he exactly he narrated, he narrated one, of one of the motion comics that we did in That's that Disney right. series. That's right. Um, and then it almost followed naturally from that that we asked him if he would also write an introduction to We Spoke Out, which he generously did. So you have a, a, two very interesting contributions from Stan, the beginning of the book and at the end, that really kind of sum up a lot of uh, the major and important themes that we want to bring out. We were talking about the educational function of these comics and also at the same time how things as they are both here at home and abroad uh, kind of warrant a collection like this, the necessity of something such as we spoke out. Is there any arrangement that IDW and Yo Books may have with educators, uh, libraries, uh, around the world or around the country in terms of putting the word out about We Spoke Out? From your well, mouth to God's ears, my friend. From your mouth to God's ears. I hope so. The IDW and, uh, you know, which Yo Books is a, is a, a uh, imprint of, uh, is distributed by Random House. And all of us, Yo being the least of the three, but uh, IDW and Random House are very excited about this book. And they certainly see the possibilities of it, uh, you know, reaching out to comic fans, the general public, and, and educators too. And there's going to be a lot of effort uh, to, to, to get the word out. And uh, you have an, you, 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 uh, you are our first uh, interview. Derek, so uh, this this is just the beginning, and we we expect uh, this to get a lot of media attention. We expect it, uh, uh, educators and comics fans, and teach and uh, uh, just the general public to really uh, you know embrace this book and see the importance of it, and 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 uh, and, and and how fascinating it is because you know we we're, we're a little scared of that educational word because we don't want anybody to think that this is. Uh, you know, just like eating green vegetables all the time, but because it's it's a it's a robust book, and, and and parts of it are entertaining. I mean, for gosh sakes, we have superheroes and on motorcycles, and uh, you know everything fighting the good fight. And so, I mean, it's it's an entertaining book, and along with being educational. But certainly, we we, we and the publisher and the and the salespeople behind the publishing company uh the great people at random house see the how this can book can go far and wide and and be an important book and uh they've had success uh with the march book and as related to uh to civil rights uh john lewis's uh, trilogy and uh and and they see this uh in in the same kind of uh uh having the same kind of feel and can be uh important uh addressing this other important area of our, our society and our culture you can see you can see the uh, the difficulty of us uh, not taking either of the definitions educational or entertaining on either side. We must you know we're floating down the middle where we know the that comic books are done for entertainment, but sometimes we handle serious uh, subjects, and this is a serious subject. So yes, it's all compiled together. So you could say it does have an educational bent or a serious bent. But at the same time, it was originally meant for entertainment. So we can neither say either one. You know, we have to say it rides the it rides in between. It's popular culture, mm. and it presents a problem that is real. And uh, so we don't we're not we don't want to take uh, credit for either end of that. We don't want to be educational. We don't want to be entertaining. But we do want people to read it and get out of it whatever they feel they can. Now. Yeah, that, that- that word edutainment always is kind of cringeworthy to me because it almost seems like it's it's neither. But this this book is both. It is educational and entertaining, and we're proud of that. And we think that's what's going to give it the one-two punch, uh, you know, to get to get the you know, to reach people and to get the message of, across in in, in a uh, popular uh, medium. I think Mouse did a, a very similar thing. I think you're talking about that same kind of. Uh 
section of, of our audience. It's kind of like mouse, only different. Now, as we record this, which is April 11th, you guys are preparing to speak this evening at the Center for Jewish History, and this is where you will launch the book. Is that correct? Yes, the Center for Jewish History is one of the most prestigious Jewish scholarly institutions in the world, and um, they will be hosting the launch event at which Neil, Craig, and I will speak, uh, and there will also be a book signing afterwards. Um, This is a combination of a commemoration of Holocaust Remembrance Day, which begins this evening, and the launching of We Spoke Out, Comic Books, and the Holocaust. Hmm. And Rocky, when it, when he first told me about the museum wanting us to be their featured uh, their feature tonight tonight for this prestigious and important uh, event, uh, he, he explained to me that they're like the Smithsonian, you know, uh, of the Jewish culture. So I mean, it's it's really a uh, I've actually put on a, a, a suit coat for tonight's. Uh, wow! Yeah, Craig yeah. in a suit coat. Yeah. So. Uh, it's 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 going to be a real honor to be there with these these gentlemen, and uh, uh, I, I, we're really excited about it. So this is the kickoff. Uh, do you either the three of you together or individually have other events in the weeks and even months to come uh, that will revolve around we spoke out? Well, we'll certainly be doing some uh, pro- some uh, panels at major comic book conventions in the year ahead. That's one segment of the of the reading audience that's interested. At the same time, uh, I will be speaking at various synagogues and Jewish community centers and other Jewish communal venues uh, where people are, of course, very interested in this topic. People, you know, in the Jewish community know a good deal about the Holocaust, but the idea that comic book creators played a played a role in, in teaching teaching young Americans about the Holocaust. That is something very unusual um, and unique and and fascinating. Actually, uh, Rafi and I and uh, Neil's uh, in the neighborhood, so we hope you'll maybe at least drop in. We're going to be at the uh, an interesting uh, convention called the what's the, the official name, Rafi? The Jewish Comic uh, Convention. Jewish Comic Con, April Sunday, April 29th in Brooklyn. Yeah, so uh, well, that's the whole industry, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, uh, Neil makes a humorous but uh, factual uh, uh, point. Uh, much of the comic book industry w- w- had Jewish uh, creators and publishers uh, behind it. And actually, I'm researching another project, uh, a, a, a book on superheroes, uh, and I was j- just uh, finding that, you know, there was quite a uh, there was a, a, some a few significant stories. Let me put it that way: of of uh, that predicted, uh, uh, you know, uh, World War II and Pearl Harbor, and 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 the comic books were coming out against uh, Hitler and the Nazis before you know our government uh, declared war uh, with for them. Those, for those of you who don't know it, if anybody's reticent to 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 say it here. The comic book industry started practically as a Jewish industry. We had Jewish uh, printers, we had Jewish artists and writers. Uh, most of the artists and writers came from the Lower East Side, which was a, uh, I wouldn't say a ghetto, but certainly was a, a cluster of uh, tremendously talented Jewish people who went into showbiz, who went into the Yiddish theater, who went into comic books. So we have, we basically have a Jew, uh, comic books have a Jewish history. It's only in uh, the recent uh, decades that we have people that are not necessarily Jewish. I mean, we we started out. Uh, Jack Kirby was is Jewish, uh, was Jewish. Stan, of course, is Jewish. Basically, the industry was very much a Jewish industry because of the Lower East Side, because that's the way New York evolved and developed. You're not going to go and get some cowboy from Wyoming to become a comic book artist. <laughs> you got the Lower East Side, and that's what, that's where we started. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Two Jewish kids in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, uh, created Superman. Bob Kane created Batman, of course, and other Jewish kids. Gil Kane, guys were changing their names because that was that time in history uh, where where people, uh, uh, Tony Curtis out in Hollywood, all actors, it was a, a very Jewish community. And now the, the that community has opened up to the world. So now you have uh, creators from all over the world 
whether they're Jewish, not black, uh, Puerto Rican, or whatever, is a very, very diverse group. But it started as a basically a Jewish industry. When I came into it, everybody that I, I mean, I certainly grew up in a, a Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn, uh, but I was just like, welcome home. This is, you know, where everybody's Jewish. Everybody, everybody knows everybody. And, and uh, I, I tremendously comfortable to move into this community of creative people. But that's essentially the way the, 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 it was. That doesn't mean that everybody in this book is Jewish. I can tell you there are a bunch, but others uh, of, later, of a later time. I don't think Wally Wood is Jewish, uh, but he certainly did one of the best jobs in this book. Gil Kane was Eli Katz, a guy who was uh, uh, started to change his name uh, uh, to uh, move into a, a broader American uh, recognition uh, with a uh, Gil Kane as his name. This well, is, uh, our, this our intro writer was Stanley Lieber, and yes. uh, and became right. uh, Stan Lee. Right, exactly. So you know, it's a this is not the coming to you from people who don't know what's going on. And, they, and you have to understand that this kind of a community was very, uh, I mean, the New York uh, Jewish intellectual community uh, of, uh, of our city was probably the most active uh, creative uh, community out there because it was all clustered together, uh, finding things to do and not being able to do other jobs that other people were not willing to let them do, but by golly could get into the creative business if they had the talent, ability, or the acumen to go ahead and do it. So um, we're talking about um, uh, an incredible community that has blossomed into an industry. I don't know that any country, you know, if you want to talk about what immigrants do for America, you better look at our creative community and see why it's the best in the world. That's great, uh, Neil. That's great. You know, and that... That brings me back to your book, We Spoke Out, because, Rafi, one of the things that you made absolutely clear, I think throughout, but especially in the earlier stories that you collect, is the fact that even though the subject matter may have been the Holocaust, at times the creators had to mask any overt references to either the Holocaust directly or Judaism. And they they express this maybe in coded ways, which strikes me as a little ironic, given what Neil was just describing, you know, that the fact that the industry in the early days, especially, was populated by quite a number of, of Jew, Jews, writers, artists, publishers, what have you. Um, almost exclusively. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't enough. It was almost exclusively. There was no other community yeah. to go to uh, yeah. that that was available in there. Yeah. Yet the irony I, is I, they couldn't speak would, out completely. They had to code well, things in a particular way. That, I wouldn't say that these comics creators, um, that the Jewish comics creators, felt they had to um, play down the the Jewish aspect in these stories. I would say that in a few cases they made a choice. Um, this is in the earlier period. Some of the stories in the 50s, they're not as explicit about the fact that the victims were Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, although it still comes through clearly, but, but they don't always, there are a few, a few of these strips, they don't always quite say it. And I think that reflects the, the era. Um, back in the 50s, it was much more of a, a general mindset in, in American culture that people should melt, that they shouldn't stress their ethnic differences. Um, and, um, and probably some of these comic book writers also felt that if they universalized it a little bit and didn't make it so much a Jewish, um, a Jewish catastrophe that it might appeal more broadly, um, to other, you know, to other readers. I think they were mistaken. I mean, it's easy for us to say that in retrospect. Um, but in any event, that attitude did not last long because, um, as you see, as you go through, we spoke out. Once you get into the even the early '60s and later, um, there's much more of a willingness to openly address the, the you know the Jewish identity of the victim. So it's really something which it's an interesting phenomenon in some of the earlier stories that they're a little more coy about it, um, but they're very explicit about it later on, and it makes the stories from the '60s, '70s, and '80s much more powerful. I think because they're more upfront about about the history that they're they're addressing. 
It may be it may be because I'm older than uh, than the other fellows that uh, I I have been through uh, uh, my of uh, the situation where I have been able to observe a little bit more history. You cannot deny anti-Semitism uh, in in America. You can't deny anti-Semitism in the world. And you have to look at it as a problem that is constantly being solved, whether it's anti-Semitism or anti-Black or anti-Puerto Rican or whatever it is. Those things exist in the world, and they did exist. And they it's sort of like a temperature. You know, it either goes up or it goes down. You have to watch it, and it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's never a good situation. People were changing their names to fit in. Uh, people were... Uh, not necessarily talking about it because they didn't feel that they perhaps they could get the job. Uh, so we have seen, we're, we live in a time now where anti-Semitism in our, in our neighborhood and where we live seems to have all but disappeared. But every once in a while it crops up. Well, when I was a young man, uh, there was more. Uh, there was more anti-black. There was, a, there was an awful lot of prejudice around. And so to crawl out of that, you had to be careful you had to be you you had to be watchful so the what we have in this book is well for example uh in america the idea that there was a holocaust in in germany was uh, insane i mean the politicians didn't believe it nobody believed it that it was it was denied you know it was uh, people uh, people spoke out about it but the, it, they weren't believed there were people who who saw this uh, these things happen came to America and testified and wrote books on it, and still people didn't believe. So uh, an awful lot of that is based on a, a, an anti-Semitic approach that is slowly going away. But it, you, to say that it's completely gone is ridiculous. Uh, it, you have to be realistic about the world that you live in. So you have people doing these stories, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish, who are saying things that maybe somebody might object to, maybe somebody might say, hey, why did you do that story? Not so much. It wasn't heavy because it was after the war. So, you know, maybe there was a little touch of, you know, do we want to go that distance? And I think that part of this uh, book is that, that taking that next step, okay, in comic books of all things, you know, with Captain Marvel and Tawny the Tiger and Atomic Mouse and all these other things, uh, um, Casper the Friendly Ghost, suddenly we have a, a story about Nazis, suddenly have stories about the Holocaust. Oh, really? Hmm, that's interesting. And you know what? Hey, Joey, come here. Can I read that comic book? That's an interesting story, and kids are talking about it. This is, we are making this, these stories are a dawning awareness of the anti-Semitism that existed, that it could go so far that there was a Holocaust and that that it's not always completely gone. You have to be very, very careful. And that's really kind of, you know, what we're saying here. I think we're saying that, yes, we're at a time, we're, we're talking about a time in history where, where we have gotten past the war and we've gotten past the Holocaust, but there's still things we're not saying and we should be saying them. And by the way, there's still things we should be saying. Dina Babbitt should have her paintings back. Her daughters should have the paintings back. And there's no reason why the state uh, in Poland should be holding on to those paintings rather than releasing them to the family. So it's the state over the individual. You know that's not fair. I know it's not fair. And fairness is something that we always aspire to. It's the goal. It's the shining light out there. But it's we're never really a hundred percent there. Now I know listeners, if they want to find out more about We Spoke Out, they can go to yobooks.com and read about it and order it that way. But is there a website devoted, if not to the book itself, then maybe subject matters, for instance, maybe even the the Babbitt uh, dilemma that um, people can go to to find out more. Well, they can certainly they can certainly write the continuity, and uh, and I'm sure Rafi has uh, email addresses that he can give out. Maybe you, as a as a service, you'd like to give out some email addresses uh, separately from this, maybe after the show, or ask people. I can uh, maybe include in the uh, the show notes how people can get in touch with Rafi. 
Yeah, absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, you go to neiladams.com. I'm right out there. Okay. Anybody in the world wants to get in touch with me, it's neiladams.com. Neiladams.com. <laughs> get your own jingle there. That's oh, right. I think it's everybody. Neil, Rafi, yep. Craig, thank all three of you for coming back on the Comics Alternative. It's really been a good time talking with you about We Spoke Out, comic books, and the Holocaust. It's been our great pleasure. Thank you very much. See you guys. Again, I want to thank Neil, Raphael, and Craig for taking the time to talk with me about We Spoke Out. It was actually not as difficult as I thought it would be, finding a time when all three of us could get together at the same time. I hope you enjoyed that conversation, and we'll check out the new book. And the best place for you to get a copy of We Spoke Out is online through our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. As I mentioned at the top of the show, if you go to dcbservice.com right now, you'll find We Spoke Out at 35% off of the cover price. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your book there, get in touch with me and let me know what you thought about my conversation with Neil, Raphael, and Craig. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. We'll be back with more interviews in the days to come, so be sure to check back for those. Until then, take care.